Good morning. Well, as we start the new year, it's real exciting to have a beautiful day like we have today to come to worship God and be with, with one another. One of the glories of the gospel is that through Jesus, think of it this way, we have access to the throne of God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we're reminded of the mercy and the grace of Jesus who came to redeem us. And so our hope and our ultimate hope is in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. And it says here, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we were, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, this morning in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We're opening our hearts to worship you with thanksgiving for giving us access to your Son, to the throne of God itself. Our heart's desire is to come to praise you for showing us infinite grace and mercy by what your son did for us on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being with us this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it's so good to see you. Why don't you stand to your feet and let's enjoy the Lord together. He is worthy indeed to be praised.
Amen. Yeah. 
Streams of mercy never 
we'll be reading from this morning is 1 Corinthians 13. 
says this. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You may be seated. We've come to the portion of the service where we worship the Lord through giving. And in this passage about love, I thought it's very fitting to just be reminded of this simple truth. We give because we love God. And we love God because he first loved us. Amen. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us first. For choosing us when we did not deserve anything. We did not deserve your love and your kindness to us, but you have saved us. So help us to give with excitement. Help us to give because you gave us more than we could ever repay. Help us to give because we love you. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for this wonderful worship set that we've enjoyed, singing your praises. Lord, you are the fount of every blessing. Even the blessings that don't look like blessings on the surface. You've given that to us. And you have promised to keep us to the very end. So Lord, help us to enjoy the rest of the service. Bless Pastor Scott as he leads us this morning in the preaching of your word. We pray that you would remove distraction from our minds and help us to love you more each and every day. Help us to worship you this morning, we pray. Amen. Amen. During our time of offering, Anna's going to lead us in a new song. Um, it's called All of Our Tomorrows, and the song is just speaking about the fact that um, the God who ordains all things has your tomorrow in mind, right? And there's nothing that happens outside of his will. Um, he is great. He is good all the time. Um, and this song is called All of Our Tomorrows. At the end of the service, we're going to sing it together corporately.
so distant now of cherished saints the sun once kissed whose beauty passed behind the clouds let all our fond and longing tears remind us we are pilgrims here we trust you so Thank you, worship team, for that beautiful reminder. It's good to see each and every one of you out this morning to come and worship and partake of the family of God and enjoy one another, enjoy each other in Christ. It is truly a blessing to stand here and see your faces and just thank the Lord. We've prayed for you all week, and here you are. And so that's a good thing. So good to have you. A couple announcements real quick. We have a membership class coming up on January 26th. Uh, this is for people who want to see who we are and get to know us a little bit and and ask questions and hear from some of our elders of what we believe and teach and how we practice that. So call the office, let them know you're coming. There'll be a light lunch. It's going to be in the fellowship hall right after church on the 22nd. Uh, in February, we're starting life seminars. You see them in your bulletin. Uh, these are uh, just something we do usually once a year. We kind of break away from our normal BFGs, our Bible fellowship groups, and we do some seminars and some things that we think are important to maybe put a little bit of attention on them. And they range from anything from marriage to finances to so forth, some of the social issues that are going on in our world and how do Christians respond, how do we have a biblical worldview to those things. These are important uh, classes, and so we invite you to grab a hold of those and join one of them. There are sign-ups in the Bible Hall, the hall right behind here, and I think in the BFG, so make sure you let us know. Just one announcement that's not in the bulletin, and Gina and I have some family coming in. So next Sunday, Gina's Mom's Moments of Grace and my men's DTB class is going to be moved to the following Sunday. I, I apologize for those um, that, that might be difficult in scheduling, but... We're trying to get a little bit of time with some family in town, and so um, uh, I will be here next, pre next Sunday morning preaching, but in the Sunday evening, we'll move those to the following one. So well, let's pray, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Father, thank you for this time in your word, Lord. We thank you that we can open your word and find truth for life, uh, truth to live this life, Lord, with all of its challenges, Lord all of its difficulties and all that we bring to it, our own sin, our own struggles, our own fleshly desires, Lord. And yet we can turn to your word to understand what is right and wrong, what is what, is what you want, Lord. We need to learn to live your way, Lord. And so, Father, I pray this morning you would stimulate us. Father, we think of those who can't be with us today. It's so wonderful to see such a full building, so many faces and wonderful souls that are here gathered, but there are some that can't, Lord. Some have gone through surgeries, some have gone through procedures, some are just not strong enough to come. And so we think of them this morning, and we love them and miss them. And we know you have their care, Lord. You know their days, you have ordained all of them. You know every fiber, every cell. 
We pray that you would continue to care for them. And in your time, Lord, bring them into your presence. We pray the same for ourselves, Lord. We don't know our days, but you do. We pray we live them to the fullest, Lord, as we serve you. Lord, thank you for our missionaries around the world. We're so, we're so glad you let us participate in that. Thank you for letting us do world missions with you, Lord, to see what you're doing around the world and join you. And so we praise you for these individuals, males and females, who have gone out, have given up a life here in the States or a life even in their own places, Lord, that could have been more prosperous to serve you. And so, Lord, help us to remember them in our prayers and our giving. Help us to remember that they are part of the great commission that you, Lord Jesus, inaugurated. Lord, bless them today, Lord. Strengthen them. Now, Lord, we pray, as Josh prayed, that you would give us ears to hear and we would listen well and the word of God would penetrate our hearts and our souls, Lord, and we would be more like you, growing ever more, conforming ever more to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ until that beautiful day when you call us to be in your presence eternally. May we keep growing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I'd like to return to my study on in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's been some time since I've been there. I think I did a Thanksgiving message after Thanksgiving and then um, all the wonderful Advent messages we've done. And then really I uh, wanted to charge the church last week with a, a passage on, on disciplining ourselves for the glory of Christ. Uh, I know many of you enjoyed that message. I did too. I enjoyed writing it and studying it. Um, but I want to get back to our series in 1 Corinthians. It's such an important book for the life of the church today. There is so much false teaching that floats through the church, and Corinthians is a great book for us to study. And so I've been longing to get back here. As we turn to our study in 1 Corinthians, we drop into chapter 13. Now, it's a very important chapter, but it is in the context of 12 through 14, right? There's a context. There's spiritual gifts. Paul's dealing with a church that has, in a sense, gone wayward from the truth. And he's trying to move them back. And my goal for these next two sermons is to preach this text back to back, if I can get through this this Sunday, to preach it back to back with, with two different thoughts going through it, but both, I believe, contextually accurate. My first time through this morning, I want to, I want to look at this in its proper context to the church of Corinth. You're going to hear me talk about this church a lot. You need to make the application to our church. I want to lay this down and make sure that uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is not plucked out of its context as it is most of the time. It lays within a very difficult church. And he's preaching on love for a particular reason to help them see their sinful pride in these areas. But next week, I want to come back, and because some of the things we're going to talk about, you're going to say, Scott, this, this stuff is impossible. This, this is not attainable on this earth. You're, I promise you're going to see this as we go through this. But it is fulfilled in one person. It is fulfilled in Lord Jesus Christ. So next week, I'm going to come back, and we're going to look at this through the fulfillment of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have someone who doesn't know Jesus, I would really encourage you to bring them because he will be exalted as I go through that and show there is no one greater who loves our souls than him. Now, most average churchgoers and even the world has heard 1 Corinthians 13, haven't they? But rarely is it taught in context. It's brought out in all kinds of things. You've heard it in weddings. You've seen it on postcards. You've seen it in Hallmark stores. The greatest of these is love, right? The last verse there. And so it has been... Uh, often used not within what God intended it to be used in, and that was to rebuke the Corinth church and to expose this pride of sin that was causing them to go astray. But with that said, there is a glorious application to this passage. And, and I know if you're a Christian in this room, as I go through this, you're going to make application. You're going to think about your marriage. You're going to think about family. You're going to think about our church. You're going to think about all these things because it just flies in your face because we don't love this way naturally and what we want to and we desire to. And so I pray you all make proper application as we go. I do want you to understand that this text is probably not the fluffy, feel-good text cuddle up on a couch that you may think it is. It is rooting out. It is rooting out hard, 
cold, superior thinking, lack of love that had made its way into the Corinth church. And I want us to respond and, and look at this and look at our own lives, mine, yours, and our own conduct. And so uh, I think sometimes I've heard this taught in this warm, fuzzy way. This, is, this isn't it. <laughs> I want you to understand that we need to love, and we need to love God's way. And, and, the, and the working of the Holy Spirit will convict us. I know it will do it. It's worked on me this whole week. Now, when we don't understand 1 Corinthians in its immediate context, it's impossible to make correct application. So that's why 1 Corinthians 13 just becomes a, a verse put on a cross stitch or a towel or shoved into a wedding ceremony in some way because it is not in its proper context. And so I, I, I want to be able to speak this and do it effectively and with the Spirit's conviction to help us create a church of humility and helping one another through relationships and loving one another and being more like Christ. That's that goal. But in order for Riverbend to do this, we have to run to Corinth. We've got to go back to Corinth. We've got to see what the problem is. This is very hard for us to look at this and say, hey, oh, wow, we're good, we're bad, we're failing, we're, we're passing, whatever. We have to go back, and that's what the Scripture does. And so chapter 13 is written, and it's placed in this letter for a reason. There is a problem here, and Paul's seeking a correction. This great church, this wealthy church, this church that has been given so much time and effort, has huge division within it. It has factions in it. It has a hyper-spirituality in it. They, they're puffed up with their knowledge. They, 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 they look down on Paul, who gave them the very words of God. They have a superiority complex. And they have caused great confusion and chaos because of their desire to put their spiritual gifts ahead of anybody else. And that's the context. And so this chapter is on love, and it's going to expose all that. And it's going to show that God desires a humble church that can be used to show this love that, that doesn't give up. It believes, it hangs in there, it endures. All those things that we're going to see, that's its goal. And I pray this will encourage you in everything from your relationships here to your relationships in the home, on the job, and everywhere else. Well, first, let's look at what I call number one, the evaluation of the loveless Corinth church. The evaluation of the loveless, loveless Corinth church. Well, it's not hard to see the word love within this chapter. It is called the chapter of love, right? Uh, and it's interesting. Paul does not use a lot of other words he could have used for love. There's a tremendous amount of words in scriptures that, that we translate love, right? It's everything from affection to feelings and other things that are given to us. But he uses the word agapeo. And, and, and this is purposeful. Uh, this is his choice, and, and that means that this love is completely undeserved. I, I start there. I know often we want to think unconditional, and that is true. That is a good definition of agape la, love. But I, I think the greater here, in particular in this context, is that love is undeserved. The love that God gives us is undeserved. Would you agree with that? And so this is what he's doing, and so it's a perfect love. And it comes from a perfect God because 1 John 4, 8 says that what? God is, he's love. So this is where Paul is going here. And so this love is poured out on us without question. Isn't that amazing? If you do do this and this and this and then you'll get my love. That's not how Jesus works. That's not how the plan of the Father ever was laid out. It is unconditional. It is undeserving. It is without question to whether we deserve it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, just a few verses later, says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. So this kind of love flows from the character of a true lover, a true lover who is God. You want to know a good lover? It's God. And even as a word wrote out, I wrote it out in my text, I go, I know where our minds go when we hear that word. He is the true lover. He loves us whether we deserve it or not, and so it is based never upon our own merit, 
It is based upon the character of God. Now, as you think about those definitions, I want to, I want our minds to, to not just get caught up in personal relationships or relationships with the opposite sex or family or children or all those times things. I, I know you're going to go there, and I think that's good. But again, the context is the church here, and we should in in and poured our thoughts into the body of Christ here. How, how do we love one another? Do we reflect this love of God? And I think this is essential to the healthy church. Last week I dropped us into John chapter 13 just for a moment. We talked about Jesus washing feet and so forth. And I, I, my thoughts went back there again because after that there becomes a discussion of who's great in the kingdom. Who's going to be the greatest between the disciples? And of course, Jesus knows this. And later in that chapter, this is the night before his death. They're going to go to the Passover feast. He's going to go to, to the Mount of Olives. There he's going to be arrested. Um, all the things are going to happen. But just, just hours before that, he says, a new commandment I give to you in John 13, 34 through 35, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now listen to this statement. This is... This is just key and a mark for us. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. See, Paul knew the Corinth church needed this kind of love. He also knew they were desperate of it because they didn't have it. And it's not some cuddle up on the couch, as I said earlier, kind of love. It's a real love, a die-to-self love, a, a realizing and, and receiving something I don't deserve type of love. That's what Paul is after. Now, the first three verses really set the scene of Corinth, and he drop us into the whole context of 12 through 14, and really the whole context of the book. It's, it's tongues, it's prophecy, it's knowledge, it's asceticism, this, this life set apart because I'm, I'm better than you type of thinking. And what Paul is saying here as we look at these first three verses is that here you, you may have these gifts and you may, you may even exercise these extravagant gifts in, in amazing ways. And you may put on this display of spiritual gift that is far superior than anyone else. But it all fails if it doesn't glorify Christ because of lack of love. Look what the verses say. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the spirit of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be born, burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Look, Paul doesn't care how gifted the Christian, uh, excuse me, the Corinth elite are here. He doesn't care how they're using it, what they've done and what they've said and how they've been recognized and so forth. He doesn't care how many people have been impressed. If it lacks love, the text says it's worthless. It's worthless. He says twice, I am nothing. Notice how his kindness and, and how he relates to them by using himself. I'm nothing and there's no profit in it. See, he's battling for superiority. Superiority is now the, what's coming home for this desire for superiority, spiritual superiority in this church is nothing. All the tongues and all the prophecy and all the things that were drawing attention to themselves, Paul is saying is Nothing. Now, as you see that word tongues, again, it is glossa. It's, it is not some ecstatic speech. It never has been. That has been uh, in a, just robbed of God's word, of what is, goes on in the many charismatic church. This is languages. And Paul, in, in, in the effect, is saying, I don't care if you can speak every language no to man. Well, that'd be pretty impressive. I've met people up that have spoken at least seven languages that I've known, missionaries and different people around the world. I, I'm just, I'm struggling with English. <laughs> I think it's amazing. But Paul is saying, because we interpret this word tongues right, I don't care if you speak every language, no, to man. If it's not done in love, it's worthless. It's such an important fact. 
such an important truth. Notice he says prophecy. Prophecy is this understanding of future events for individuals, for the world, for the church. Uh, all these mysteries and knowledge and, and empowering faith. I don't care if you have all of that. It's nothing. He moves on to asceticism. This ascetic life that they who had been teaching on, if you remember all the way back to chapter 7, they were even encouraging divorce so that you could set yourself aside because you'll be more spiritual because you won't have any hindrances. That's how far their false teaching and their knowledge and their superiority had taken them. And Paul says, look, I, I don't care. I don't care if you sell everything. I don't care if you burn your body. If you don't have love, it profits nothing. See, it's worthless martyrdom if, you, if, you, if you're not martyred for Christ. <laughs> right? There was a problem in the Reformers' days. There were some that were starting to seek that because the Reformers and some of those who legitimately died for the faith, it became glorified in some of the Christian communities. And so there was writings and there was sermons given not to pursue those things, but we should pursue life, which is try to stay alive for the sake of the gospel. But martyrdom could be worthless. And notice the result of all of this in verse 1. It's just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Gina was Christmas shopping this year, and I was getting bored. And I went outside and was waiting for her to come out, and the Salvation Army person was there, and they're clinging that bell. It was giving me a headache. I thought, you know, I'm thinking I was going to give him money and ask him if he'll quit. I was thinking about this text and thinking about this word clanging gong. I thought, well, what if I hired him and just had him there just ring that thing the whole time I'm preaching? I wonder if he'll get the message. This is what this is. I don't know about that bell, why they chose that thing. It's obnoxious. And they're trying to get money. That's what Paul's saying. All of this tongues and knowledge and mysteries and prophecy and, and setting yourself aside for God without love is just worthless. It profits nobody. It doesn't profit you. It doesn't profit God. It doesn't profit nobody. You're just this loud, irritating noise. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. This has been a theme of his. He started here, and he's going to go right on through 14 with. He says, now concerning the sacrifices to idol, they had messed that up, right? They got involved with things they shouldn't have been hanging around. We know that we all have knowledge. This is the problem. Oh, yeah, look, I know the truth, so I can go, still go hang out with my relatives or in these pagan festivals and so forth. Then he says this, knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. This is his theme, and he's going to do this all the way through 14 when he's trying to expose their false view and false use of the gifts. And when we exercise our spiritual gifts from hearts and minds that are not set on the love of God, they don't edify. They are a clanging, a clanging gong. They are, they are a symbol that irritates you, and yet God wants our gifts to be edifying. He wants them to edify us. And so when love takes a back seat to knowledge, to, to wisdom, even, even the study of men that I appreciate who work on eschatology and things that, that are a little more hazy in the scriptures to help us see that if that's not done in love, it profits nobody. So this is why Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and, and attain some angelic speech, isn't that amazing? The charismatic church, some of them are after some angelic prayer language. We don't even know if they, what they talk. We don't know anything. Everything we see them say, we, they heard it in their own languages. And yet somewhere along the line, somebody thought, well, if I, could pray, if I could speak like an angel. All self, all building up of self. So Paul says, look, if I could speak every tongue known to man on this earth, if I could attain some angelic speak, if I could put on the best show and even lay my life out in martyrdom, it's all worthless compared to knowing and living love. So the context as we move into 14, and this is why you say, well, why does he start with tongues? Because this ecstatic speech is the idea here. It's been a problem. 
And so he starts with that to expose that that has a very prideful aspect to it. It still is a struggle today in many people's lives. If you've been around anybody who claims to speak in tongues, I I don't know if you've ever done it. It's confusing and it's chaotic and it's often awkward. I've had it happen to me a couple of times. I said, I'm here. My language is English. I, I understand you. Can you talk? Let's talk. What, what's so glorious that I need to know? Why, why, why put the room in confusion? Gina and I, in our younger days, we remember going to some Christian concerts and that was going on all around us. Like, man, get me out of here. It's just confusion. Nobody knows what anybody's saying. And so this was not done in love and Paul knew it. Others want this angelic prayer language that's moving around, and yet they can't share the gospel with their neighbor in a loving way, which is more, point, which is more powerful. And I think that's Paul's point. It's noisy, gong, it's a clinging symbol. And here the Corinth church was in the midst of a very wicked society. They lived in a religious city. You have to understand, it's religious, but it's pagan. And in the center of that are these gods, n- namely uh, Dionysus, this god that they worshipped. And one of the things they did with her is they had a sheet of copper that they bend, just one single sheet, and they beat that thing over and over in worship of her. Kumbayan is the word, believe it or not. Kumbayan is the word there for this clanging symbol here. And when I read that, I began to understand he's speaking about this. And everyone that would have heard this would have understood, oh, Paul's talking about that pagan symbol that they keep beating. But he's connecting it to false worship. And so I think Paul's saying here, you sound like that one note, irritating pagan piece of copper because you practice your gifts without love. It's quite a statement, isn't it? This is serious. And Paul is love. He's injected himself in there. You see his personal pronouns. Uh, All of these things are in there, but yet he is serious because it's robbing people from the gospel. Verse 2 doesn't let up. Here he highlights prophecies, mysteries, and knowledge, human faith that could remove mountains. Well, that's impossible. That's That's only God can do those things, right? And so in these prophecies and these mysteries and knowledge, remember they were all about knowledge. And Paul just says, all I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I got. I I love that verse. If you've been in my office, it's on my wall. You've seen it. I absolutely love that verse. Because when it comes down to, to fighting for the faith, standing for truth, that's all I know is Jesus died for my sins and he rescues sinners. That's what he does. And so I love to stand on that. Everything else amounts to zeros, amounts to nothing. And I, and I think everything else is offensive to God if it's not done in love. It's offensive to man at times. And it certainly is to God. Look at chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. I did a cursory read through the chapter several times this week to get my mind back around what's going on here. Paul here says, For the man... For no man can lay a foundation, 311 I'm in, other than that which is laid, which is in Christ Jesus. Now if any man builds on a foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay and straw and their great gifts that they have. That's my thought there. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And if that man's work which has been built on it remains, he will receive reward. But if that man's work is burned up, he will suffer suffer loss. See, Paul has been on this. He's been talking about this all the way through. So someone may say, look at these people who have such great gifts. We're so human, aren't we? We look around and we See somebody with a great voice or ability to play things or speak or, or work with children in an amazing way or whatever it is, and we, and we begin to envy those things. And yet God, God says even those who have the most talent, 
the, the most natural gifting you could ever see, if left to themselves, with not done in love, not done for the sake of the gospel, for the glory of Christ, they cling to me. You watch some of these preachers, which I don't, but every once in a while I see a clip. Some of those are so gifted people. Oratorically, they are amazingly gifted people. And yet, they, all they talk about love and your best life now and all that love stuff, that's not, they're, they're not talking about this love. They're talking about human love. They're talking about a fallen love. And they're clinging gone to God. But what if you're really good at prophecy and you have worked hard and you're unveiling all the mysteries of eschatology and you have deep insight and knowledge into God's word and you have an incredible measure of faith that God has granted you to do things for his glory, but all this is done throughout love, without love, it's just strike the symbol again. I heard a preacher one time say, if I offered you a million dollars but I'm going to take away one digit, what would you have? And the one digit is the one. You have seven zeros. And some of us may think we're gifted in something. Take away truth. Take away the love of God. It's nothing. It's nothing. And it's a good reminder. And you may, you may contain all the spiritual gifts this Bible speaks about. You may have even incredible natural gifting, but without love, they are nothing. Look at verse 3 with me. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, that sounds good. And if I surrender my body to be burned, oh, lay it all down. Look at him. But do not have love. It profits me nothing. If I choose this ascetic life, if I give away everything I have, if I even have my body burned to martyrdom without love, there's nothing. See, the context in chapter 12 was remember, they thought they were superior. So, um, yes, I'm the mouth, you're the foot, you're nothing. And so Paul goes really hard, right? The foot can't say this and the eye can't say this. And he works all through that because there are superiority within there. And it's all done because of a lack of love. And so I think this is Paul's evaluation of the Corinth church. How are we doing? Second thought. The characteristics of love that were missing in the Corinth church. I think here we see Paul magnifying love as the greatest importance in these next few verses. And as we've seen just in the, the first three here, without it, all the greatest gifts, the most powerful tools for the gospel and, and without a care for one another, they come to zero. But certainly, this would provoke the question is, what is love, right? That's what would come next, and Paul anticipates that by the leading of the Spirit. Well, what is love, and what does it look like? And so, here the Spirit of God leads Paul to tell this loveless church what is indispensable. And, and now he gives them a list pointing to the perfection of love. Now, I don't think this is an exhaustive description of love. I think it's a pretty good one, but it's what the church in Corinth needed, and it's what we need. Now, I want to move through these quickly, and I'm going to come back and hit them in higher uh, levels through Christ next week. But first of all, verse 4, look at it. says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, love is not arrogant. Love is patient, the Bible says. This word speaks of one who suffers long. I found one good translation of it that I really liked. The author said this, it is used of one who receives an unfairly costly injury, but did not seek revenge. Whew. See, I think Paul's desire for the church in Corinth was for the people there to be indwelt by the Spirit, be filled by the Spirit, and endure injustices because of their love for one another. This is why he starts out with this. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And, and, and many people believe love is the dominating fruit of the Spirit, and everything flows from that, and I tend to agree with that. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, right? And so here there's this 
costliness when we suffer, when you and I suffer unjustly, will we still love? Paul loves these terms. He uses this, this, this term patient. He talks about them all the time throughout scriptures. First Thessalonians 5, 14, we urge you, brother, and listen to this, admonish the unruly, that means the undisciplined, the disorderly. Encourage the faint-hearted, that's the despondent, the discouraged. Help the weak, that's the sick. It's everything from sick to unoppressive, those who are not very impressive people. And then he says this, be patient with everyone. That's what the Bible teaches. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through 21, I've lived in these verses in my own ministry through the years, trying to find favor with the Lord and ask him to help me through difficult times. He says this, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin, you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if, remember, we love those conjunctions, When you do what is right and suffer for it patiently and endure it, this finds favor with God. And then probably the greatest verse that brings us all together, and we'll look at this more next week, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. God uses suffering to conform us. And we are in a society where no suffering Man, we've got to stop it somehow. We've got we to get away from it. A, 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 a football league that kneels to all kinds of things is now on their knees because a young man suffered a heart attack arrest. And they're praying on TV. They're praying on the field. All of that's unleashed now, right? Isn't it? Before, when a man would not kneel to something else, he was persecuted for those things. What will you suffer for? Where will you stand for Christ? Where will you kneel for Christ? Where will you patiently take what God has allowed in your life so that he'll conform you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ? Press on, brothers and sisters. There is a great reward. The Bible says love is kind. Nextly, I need to move through these. This word speaks of putting oneself at a, listen to this, at a ready aid of others no matter what the cost. The word conveys the idea of a mixture of usefulness, and listen to this, and availability. I'm useful and I'm available. I'm I'm giving myself to you. Corinth lacked this love. They were unuseful and they were unavailable to each other because they were so high on their own stuff. Oh, you don't speak in tongues? Sorry, get behind me. We'll see this in verse Corinthians. He has to teach them to get in line because they're so involved in themselves. See, this is one willing to to count the cost, to be available, to aid others. That's what kindness is. And this desire for superiority just robbed them of the kindness of love. But love that remains useful and available is a lasting love, brothers and sisters. It outweighs the hard hearts, right? It softens our heart when we say, God, I'm going to stay in this. It's, it's a tool God uses to bring reconciliation. It's the second, third, fourth, fifth mile that you go. Even with your enemies. Love is not jealous. This is the first of eight attributes that are given in a negative, a negative way, not meaning negative like you think, but use the word not. It's a... Paul uses a negative to produce a positive, right? Love is not jealous. And I need to truly know that we love, we must understand what jealousy is. The word's an interesting word. It means to boil inwardly. It's not always used negative. You just look at chapter 12, verse 31, just above there. Paul says, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I will show you the more excellent way. I think that's what he's doing in chapter 13. That word earnest is the same word. So there is a boiling for earnesty, earnesty for the things of the Lord. You can boil for those things. When I was a young preacher. I was a little more wound up than I am, believe that or not. A good friend of mine named Dr. George Fox, he's with the Lord. 
Uh, he came up to preach at our first church, and I'll never forget the first thing he says. He said, if that man doesn't keep his furnace boiling in him like he does, throw him out. <laughs> I said, thanks, Dr. Fox. Um, I think that's a boil, right? There should be a boil in us. There's a good aspect to that. We should, that helps us stay in the fight. It helps us lean into the difficult things that we challenge in Christianity, right? In our lives, in our families, in our churches, in this world. But that's, I don't think that's the problem here. The problem is they're boiling for their own goals, right? They're after the selves. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. He says, you are still fleshly. Well, why are they still fleshly? And he gives a reason. Because there is jealousy and strife among you. That's, that's the problem. See, they're not boiling for the things of the Lord. They're boiling for their own, their own truth. And so I, I think only a Christian can get, find freedom from the negative sinful results of jealousy and become the one whom God's love causes them to be zealous and and, and to really, truly, unconditionally love one another. Do you burn for the love of God and for the love of others? They didn't. Corinth Church did not. That's why this great chapter is in the spot it's in, and you can't take it out of that context and then understand what the power of this text is. Next one, love does not brag. The root word, we get the English word boast from it. It has the idea of parading oneself in front of others. I thought, wow, that's Corinth. That's exactly what he has been describing through the first 12 chapters. Corinth was parading its individual gifts in front of each other, provoking jealousies, bringing on division and factions, and exalting self-righteousness. And that's why this chapter has to be written. And instead of showing off the glories of Christ and how he had rescued them. They're showing off themselves. And it came at great expense. Can you imagine somebody in chapter 7 who their spouse left them because they were convinced by the Corinthian leadership that they would be more spiritual if they left them? Imagine what that person felt like. I mean, there was just destruction. Instead of Showing off Christ, we, I can put us all in that, can't we? We often will show off ourselves. And showing off is self-righteousness. And, and I think what it does, it invites competition. And not good competition, bad competition. Because one gets up and does something, oh, somebody's got to do that, right? We always had this phrase in our house growing out that, that one more statement, that outdo that one statement, you know, top that guy statement. And then finally, some comedian said, well, I've been to the moon, <laughs> right? How do you top that? Well, I've done this and I've done that. And that's what they were doing. I think this tops all statements. I desire to have the love of God for each and every one of you. Love is not arrogant is the next phrase there. Notice this word denotes the idea of being overinflated. It's an interesting word. It has a sophisticated knowledge. It's often used of an inward arrogance. That means it's hidden on the outside. You don't see that arrogance and that puffed up knowledge on the outside. It's on the inside and it makes its way out. Look at chapter 4, verse 18. He's warned them of this. Now some of you have become arrogant. He just says it straight out. Chapter 5, verse 2. You have become arrogant. You got an incredibly wicked, immoral situation in your midst, and you're not mourning over it because of your arrogance. Chapter 5. See, this is a result of a church that won't submit itself to the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, back in chapter 13 love does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not act unbecomingly. It denotes the idea of disgraceful or dishonorable. It actually leans towards indecent behavior. The church of Corinth was rude. Let me put it that way. They were rude. 
They were rude to one another. They were rude to Paul. They were rude to the gospel. They are rude to God. The, the root word gives the idea of unformed. And so when I saw that, I thought, instead of forming who they are around the gospel in Jesus Christ, they remain unformed in their own personalities and spiritualities and all the things that they're pursuing. May God form us around his son and his word. That's where we have to be formed. And that takes, <laughs> it takes a lot. It's difficult, right? Love does not seek its own. The idea is it's never a self-seeker. This instruction is closely linked to what Paul's teaching on the goals of edification that he taught on in chapter 10 on Christian liberties. The true love sought to edify and build up versus tear down and draw away and stand on your freedoms and your liberties and don't care about people. Look at chapter 10, verse 33, how he sums up really using his own example as one who doesn't seek his own. Verse 33, just as I also Please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. There's a greater goal, isn't there? I think we can easily, and thank God that people are not saved because we, what we do or don't do, that is God who does that. But Paul saw it from a human standpoint of view. He says, look, I, I don't want to be a self-seeker because I, I, I want you to get saved. I want people to come to Christ. I think that's a great motivation, isn't it? Corinth did not know how to use love in their freedoms. And they hurt a lot of people. Love and selfishness are never friends, brothers and sisters. Love does not provoke. It literally has the idea of, a, we get the idea of something sharp from it. The Corinth church was edgy. They were provoking, prodding. They were irritating one another. They even got to the point where they would sue one another. Can you imagine that? They would not go to the church to solve their issues. They'd run to the world. There's an embitterment that was in plaguing the church of Corinth. Paul might have struggled with some of these things. Acts chapter 15, 39, he says, And there occurred, Luke writing about Paul, occurred a sharp disagreement. That's our same word. Sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him, and they sailed away to Cyprus. I think Paul understood that there's times where flesh gets involved in things. But we've got to repent of those, turn back from them, because provoking comes from a love of self, not an agape love. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. This literally carries the idea of not holding the offender accountable for evil or injury that one has suffered because of them. I want to read that again. It, it has the idea of not holding the offender accountable for evil or injury one has suffered because of them. Boy, does that go against every thought of our being, isn't it? That person did that? Where's the justice in this? Tell that to Jesus on his way to the cross. See, we're taught to live like Jesus. And if we're going to do that, we're going to suffer injustice. And that means that we can't keep a record of those things. And so this kind of love closes the book on the accounting record that has happened to us. I'm not going to pin more in the ledger of my hurt feelings. I'm going to forgive. And doubtlessly, Paul must have seen the Corinth church keep such records, and he feared that they would take vengeance on each other. This kind of love does not exist with God. He took our sins away. He canceled out our debt. And he expects us to live in such a way. Verse 6 says this, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. And righteousness can never be a part of the foundation of a true biblical church. I want you to know that. And unrighteousness will never be a product of true joy for Christ's church. 
I think Corinth was pretty joyless. And yet it seems to be the case there. They engaged in pagan festivals. They had no problem going there and offending their weaker brother or sister. And so they engaged in unrighteousness. And look, the world loves unrighteousness. The last verse of Romans 1, and we all know Romans 1, the greater part of that passage, boy, the first half is beautiful and you can't miss that, but the greater part of that passage is depravity, isn't it? And the final verse says this, verse 32, and although they know the ordinances of God, but those who practice such thing are worthy of death. They know the ordinance of God. They know that the wages of sin is death. Look what they do. They not only do the same, but they also heartily approve of those who practice them. Joy and unrighteousness and truth will never go together. Love always finds joy and righteousness. This is the key here. Paul's trying to expose, you're, you're trying to find joy, and yet your church is engaged in unrighteousness. You're, you've attacked the sanctity of marriage that God had put down. You, you've abused the gifts that I've given you. You've ran to the world for knowledge and mysteries and all of those things. You want to be front and center with some ecstatic speech that no one can understand. God's telling them through Paul, I love righteousness and I love truth. And that's where joy comes from. Jesus is the joy giver and he always speaks in truth. Agape love rejoices in truth. So you always find righteousness. When you find righteousness, you'll find truth. When you find truth, you'll find righteousness. And that's why Paul puts them together in this passage. They're inseparable. There's an inseparable bond between them. And that's why God's word is the standard of truth. God is the standard of truth. His righteousness instructs us in everything that is truthful. And so when we're in a world, and sadly, a church state in America that is abandoning the clear principles of life before birth, marriage, gender, and all of those things, they abandon those things. They are applied and running to unrighteousness. And brothers and sisters, we got to have to lean into this because they're not going to put up with us. But I want you to remember this verse. The Bible teaches us over and over that, that the love of God is, is, does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in truth. Well, verse 7, we find four things that love does do. Hmm. Look at this. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I believe these are paired. Bears and believes go together really nice. Hope and endure go together really sweetly. But all four are so closely related, and they're all so dependent upon one another. Bears all things gives this idea of one who will not tolerate everything because of unconditional love. He'll, excuse me, he'll keep, she will keep tolerating. It's a tolerating of things. And I know we'll talk about this more. You go, Scott, I have this question on this, but how much do we do with this? It can still love despite what's happening to them is the idea. It tolerates whatever it needs to tolerate because unconditional love for those around them it doesn't, doesn't mean it's in agreement with sin in any way. Oh, I'm just going to bear it. I'm going to let my children drift off into the vile things of the world. No, that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible says it stays in it. Believes all things. It's a display of love that is welcoming and trusting. Boy, man, if we lose that, we're in trouble. Agape love gives us the ability to to believe, to hang in there, to trust. See, this gives us ability to give hope to those around us. And that's what the Bible says, because love hopes all things, knows that better things will come with this great agape love if we'll embrace, whether that's someone we're trying to help or ourselves or whatever it may be, if we embrace this type of love, there's good things that'll come from that. Maybe not fully seen in this life, but I'll guarantee you in the next. Romans 5, 5 says, and hope, there's a hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You want to have that kind of hope? It's already there if you have the love of God in you. 
We just have to apply it. This church, this, I've studied it so much, and I've put my mind into that and tried to picture even historically how it's laid out and, and the, the gap of the water that went between them and another continent and so forth. I've tried to walk into that city in my mind and think about this church and how they were failing. And they were given so much. When we have this hope that's poured out in love, it causes us to endure all things. Greek word, therefore, endure, has this idea of continually pressing forward, even in difficult opposition. But look, a self-righteous, superior attitude, that was among the Corinth church, and it had led to demise to these four traits, these four agape love traits, right? It had led to demise of that. And the result was the Corinth church was failing, which is contrary to this unconditional love. Because look in verse 8, love never fails. That was failing in there. It's clear. Read the text. Corinth was failing. And when we do the scorecard and we look at this, we go, why am I failing? Because the love of God is not being properly handled in our lives. And that's what's going on in Corinth. So when Paul writes these things, he's trying to help them understand that their lack of patience, kindness, their growing jealousies, their bragging, their arrogancy, their unbecoming behavior, their self-seeking, provoking, their records of wrongs has led them to rejoice in unrighteousness and not find true joy and the truth, which results in a church that does not bear with one another, believe one another, hope one another, and was not enduring in love with one another. But Paul reminds them, true love does not fail. That's what we're after. And I think Corinth was, I think they're probably an energetic church. I think they were probably dynamic. They had a lot of gifts. The gifts were still in operation, all of them. I think the gifts were in full display there. But the real problem was not the gifting that they had. The problem was immaturity. And this is what Paul's pointing to. There's a level of immaturity here. And doubtlessly, hey, they had good worship and singing and deep, full, deep insight because they were big into knowledge and mysteries. The church was full of a bunch of show-offs and prideful people who were immature. And because of this, they failed to focus on the characteristics that build the church in unity and edification. And pride caused them to be factitious, and it left the broken lives in a wake of that. I think the real failure is found in verse 7. And here's what it is. I think these four things given to us are unconquerable. But they thought they were. (laughs) When I study these four things, like believes all things, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures, I said, I can't do that, Lord. Not in this life, I cannot do that. I, I cannot do this. I have failed in these things countlessly. But the problem was, they thought they could. They looked at these things and said, oh, those are for the now when they're for the then. And that's a huge problem. This is what's happening. And you study this book, you begin to realize they lived in the then and not the now. And so they got the then wrong because they couldn't live correctly now. And that happens all the time. And so these things are an eternal pursuit. When I looked at this verse 7, this bearing and believing and hoping and enduring, I said, Lord, this is an eternal pursuit that I'm never going to get to this on this earth. But someday when the perfect comes, we'll we'll see that probably next week. um, When we see that, that's where I'm going to arrive. But the problem with this church is they were trying to have things that they could not have and they were trying to get them on their own not through the strength of the Spirit. And they failed miserably. You say, well, Scott, aren't we supposed to be transformed into the image of Christ? Absolutely. But it's a lifetime pursuit, isn't it? Have you accomplished that yet? Anybody want to come up here and take over and say, hey, I'm fully conformed to the image of Christ. That's why doing this is such a hard task. Because your pastor is not that person. I'm not there yet. 
But I realize that. And so when we pursue agape love as a church or Corinth was supposed to be using, we never fully reach it in this life. But nevertheless, this is our goal. This is our target. We're encouraged through the scriptures. We're rebuked in the scriptures to go this direction. And when we pursue these things, there are fruit in our life and there's fruit in others. And we strive for these things. And so we don't give up. We keep striving to bear with all things. We keep striving to believe all things. We keep striving to put our hope in all things. We keep striving to endure in all things. Otherwise, sin wins and division happens. This is the great difference in the churches that house the glory of God and those who house the glory of men. That's the difference. Three, I want to just touch on this and we're going to sing, I promise, Hayward. Can't do it twice to him. I'm going to come back to this, but I just want to touch on just a few things here. Third, the gifts of the Spirit are for this age, but love is eternal. You heard me leading into this thought. I think everything in verses 8 through 13 say this. They point to the fact that the gifts are temporary, but love is eternal. And that's what I mean. They were, they were after what was eternal here on earth. They were after those things. They were trying to, to have what was only temporal. And they were trying to make that as though they had reached eternity, as though they had reached perfection. Look at verses 8 through 10. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. So here we begin to understand all of these gifts. He's saying, look, these gifts, these things that you are cherishing, that you're holding on, that's causing your sinful uh, uh, pride and spirituality that boast, you're boasting in and pushing you up, these things are going away. You're hanging on to something that's, that's going to die and fade away. The completion of the scriptures coming just for number one. But more importantly is the eternal state is coming. And that's where we find perfection. When we see him, we will be like him. You're chasing the wrong things, is what Paul says in this passage. These spiritual gifts are not a sign of perfection. That's what he's telling them in this passage. These are not a sign of perfection. You know what is? Love. God's love. That's what we pursue. And along the ways, if he gives you the ability to speak several languages and share the gospel, praise the Lord. If he gives you a heart to study the scriptures and all of them to understand eschatology and you can still do that with love, praise the Lord. If you want to grow in knowledge and get degrees and do all that stuff and love, 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 praise the Lord. But your gifts are not perfection. There's an eternal state is where we arrive in perfection, look at verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. And when he became a man, I did away with childish things. Isn't this interesting? Don't you see the kindness of Paul? He inserts this personal pronoun here. He brings himself into this. But the reality is about Corinth. Your children, your desires for these gifts expose your immaturity. You're immature. Chapter 3, verse 1, he told them this. And my brother, and I do not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men as flesh, as infants in Christ. Chapter 14, we're going to hear this again in verse 20. Brethren, you do not, uh, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but you are thinking, it be, but be thinking in maturity. So here he reminds them of this. Listen, brothers and sisters, maturity in the faith is not perfection. Perfection is the eternal state. I'm going to pick up with this idea next week of this fully known. And I, I, I just overwhelmed at that last phrase um, that we find in verse 12. See, we see me dimly, but we're going to be, we're going to know, we're going to understand. There's a day coming. We're going to get this. We're going to understand these things. And that's when we arrive in perfection, when we stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in the eternal state. I know this is challenging. I'm not done. I'm coming back. 
Round two. Are you ready for it? Next week, bring somebody who you want God to save. Father, thank you for this time together. In a moment, Lord, we're going to lift our voices and we're going to sing. And there's some in this room who have beautiful voices. We're going to hear them. You've gifted them. And then there are some of us who make a joyful noise. But Lord, that's not what defines us. What defines us is the love of God that was poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The pursuit of love. An unconditional love, an undeserved love that we have received. It is the pursuit of that. That defines us as Christians. And so, Lord, now we sing to you. We've heard from your word. And we want to sing one more time to you. And we pray that you would help us love, love, love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a great charge this morning. Church, why don't you stand? We're going to sing the song that we introduced during our offering time called All of Our Tomorrows as Anna leads. And just invite you to sing this song out. spinning world by your own hand hurls ever on around the sun the seasons march at your
remain standing for our closing benediction. I took this right out of scriptures. Our gracious God and Savior, may you direct our hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. May our faith and hope be in the one who is able to keep us from stumbling and make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. We praise the only God and our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord to be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen.